So in this video, I want to talk about what happened to support for Ukraine over time and what's going on in Washington and why. We're going to start with an interview in the Kiev Post. This is with Jason Smart. He's an American who's trying to unpack for the Ukrainians what's actually going on. And I think his interview is, is spot on. Um, and then after that, we're going to look at a number of uh, statistics, including mostly drawn from Pew Research, which is very, very respectable research, and try to unpack what is happening. I will tell you up front, I don't have definitive answers. I have suspicions, but I'm not sure that they're right. And so uh, we just need to process through this together. Here's the interview. We'll begin now. Hello. Welcome to our latest broadcast uh, in Kiev Post. I'm Bogdan Nahailu, the chief editor, and I'm very happy to have our colleague from uh, the U.S., our Washington correspondent. We call him the Washington Insider, Jason Smart. Jason, it's good that you're here at this moment because a lot is happening in Washington, not all of it good for Ukraine. You've been following this very closely. In fact, you've written about it today for us. Can you tell us in a few words what are the main takeaways and, more importantly, what are the implications for Ukraine? So the biggest thing that's happening now is simply, as you saw yesterday, the Senate voted against Ukraine. Um, the Senate was thought to be the easier of the two. The House of Representatives, controlled by Republicans, was thought to be harder. But in the case of the Senate, the Democrats were not able to convince nine Republicans to come over to vote with them. And so it didn't go through. Now, unfortunately, next week... And there's a reason for that. So in the Senate, you need a threshold of 60, not 50, because that's Senate rules. And the nine Republicans didn't go over because the Republicans, rightly or wrongly, and I think wrongly, because I, I think you need to prioritize what's going on with Ukraine over these other things. But rightly or wrongly, wrongly, they are holding fast to this idea of tying it to the border. And the... Democrats are not working with them on that particular issue in order to get to this issue. And so for that reason, it failed. But it was going to fail. It was already baked in that it was going to fail. I told you that a couple uh, days ago, maybe a week ago. It's going to fail. And then they're going to get together and they're going to work out some kind of compromise. This is the way politics works. Each side's trying to say the other side's a terrible whatever and bludgeon the other side verbally for political advantage. And then there's gridlock and then they work out a deal. I'm convinced that they still will work out a deal. Is the last week the Senate is in session before Christmas holidays. It seems likely they'll stay in session though afterwards. That's something mm -hmm. that the legislative body's head can choose to do. And he probably will uh, because there is an urgency of getting aid for Ukraine as well as for Israel. Now, what are the implications? I think in session is a great thing. It's kind of like at, at the end of my class, if I said, okay, this is the last thing that I have to say uh, before we can go. And then I say, are there any questions? Guess what? No one ever has a question if I preface that before that. If that's the thing standing between them and going home or getting out of my class. So I think that's actually going to work in favor of actually getting a deal done. I would argue that the biggest implication here is just how much Washington has changed. Uh, a year ago, That's Washington true. was full of Ukrainian flags. There was huge support. Uh, the president was able to get through a lot of different things, uh, seven pieces of legislation to support Ukraine. Uh, today, that's no longer the case. It's clearly going to be an uphill battle going forward. Now, it's changed over time, and it's changed in various ways. It's changed where it used to be r the anti-Russia faction was Republican, and now the anti-Russian faction is mostly Democrat. It's a very strange thing to watch, and I'll show you in Pew Research how that works. Why do you think that is? Is it just uh, fatigue, Ukraine fatigue, or are there other issues that are um, driving Ukraine off the radar screen? Well, there's been a host of factors. Amongst those factors is, yes, there's certainly Ukraine fatigue. We're nearing the two-year anniversary since the full-scale invasion. Uh, the population in the U.S. You know, has moved on to other things, and it's just no longer the central issue for them. Uh, there's always so much they can read about Ukraine before it becomes old news, no matter what the story is. So what is the central issue in, in the States these days? So by far, the biggest issue is immigration. The Republicans are specifically trying to tie the assistance for Ukraine to immigration. That is, unless the White House is willing to go along with very serious reforms of how immigration and the asylum process work, they're not going to vote for Ukraine. 
And we see in the polling that 58% of Republicans list immigration as the top or the second top issue for them in all the polling that's come out. So you hear that? For Republicans, it's a top or second top issue for them. Sometimes it's beaten by inflation or things along those lines, but it is a huge issue. Now, I know that some people were saying they want an issue that will never go away. I don't believe that that's as a Republican, I'm saying I don't believe that that's what Republicans are thinking. You can think that. I could be wrong, and I could be wrong in reading all my Republican friends, but I think that that's really a significant thought in their mind, okay? So just take that for what it's worth. You don't have to agree with me, but I'm telling you the way that... I understand how they see it is not that it's we just want to have this false issue. If you could relieve that, they would happily pay a cost of a high price for Ukraine in order to get there. Now, those are the isolationist Republicans. I'm in the conservative, Reagan conservative type of Republican where that never changed. And I'm just saying, just support Ukraine. Give them the money. So it seems very clear that this needs to be addressed. Uh, going forward, it's going to be very difficult for the White House to continue avoiding this if it does want to help Ukraine get the assistance. So how uh, has President Biden reacted to this? So President Biden has shown a lot of leadership with this. At the same time, the tenure of the White House has changed. There is a lot more, I wouldn't say alarmism, but concern being expressed. Uh, and that concern has included even yesterday, President Biden made remarks. Uh, he mentioned Putin by name 11 times in his speech, which is quite unusual. Uh, and he also raised the possibility that Ukraine could be taken by Putin. It is a real thing that could happen. This cannot be ruled out. And if Ukraine is deprived... So I don't think that that's going to happen. I think it's a slim possibility. But the slimness is thickening a little bit as time goes on. And that's the danger. So the political games are the way that the political system works. And that, that be, creates even greater danger in Ukraine is sickening. But that's the way the systems work working. I, I, I'm not trying to justify what's happening. I'm trying to explain so that you understand what's happening. And again, I support Ukraine to the tune that I have a thousand plus videos on this channel supporting Ukraine. Of munitions and deprive the, the weaponry that it needs to defend itself. Uh, that is realistic. It could happen. But is Ukraine, uh, with, you mentioned what happened on Wednesday, is Ukraine getting a, a fair hearing in the media in the U.S. these days? Yeah. I think that overall the U.S. media is very favorable to Ukraine. I see that the support there is good. If you look at the daily papers in the U.S., Ukraine does come up a lot still. Um, but unfortunately, it seems the coverage is good in newspapers, articles, things along those lines. But there's very little normal media coverage like on TV. And, and that's where the problem lies. And that's why the source of information that you have to go to very often is YouTube. Is that the average rank and file voter doesn't really connect with that as much. Uh, it's no longer mm -hmm. a pressing issue for them. About 1% of Republicans list Ukraine as being the top issue for them in the next elections. Okay, so I, I might be in that category. In fact, I am in that category. But this is a very important issue. It's critical. It's hyper important. Now, the, I'm going to show you how the differences lie between different issues before I move on to what's happened, how support for Ukraine has ebbed and flowed over time before we get done with this video. Well, and yesterday, I think we had the uh, fourth debate uh, Republican debate before their primary uh, connected with the forthcoming presidential election. Uh, what do we make of that? So during the debates, we saw what we've seen in the previous debates. Uh, Nikki Haley, as well as Chris Christie, have shown very strong support for Ukraine. Uh, it's very clear that they both understand that it's, you know, Ukraine is very, very important, but it's got an entire uh, geopolitical context as well. It's very important. Uh, and that Ukraine's victory is something that will help provide security for all of Europe That's and right. also provide security for other places like Taiwan. Um, so if the U.S. were to back out now, that provides a huge number of problems for America's interests going forward mm -hmm. for many years to come. And who was the victor then in this debate? Well, sadly, it would appear that President Donald Trump, who did not participate in the debate, was the winner. Uh, between the fighting that occurred between the very four candidates in the debate, uh, the lack of clear messaging they were probably able to convey, uh, polling numbers show that Donald Trump has continued to grow in the ratings over the past several months. And yet, uh, 
President Biden doesn't think that Trump will be reelected as president again. Well, Biden, of course, is hopeful that he will be reelected as president. A lot of people think, though, there's a good chance he'll go through the primaries, and he might very well at that point decide to put in somebody else to be the Democratic nominee. President Biden, that is. That is. Okay. Is there any uh, silver lining in these dark clouds? Well, I think the silver lining here is that the Republicans, I'm quite sure, will in the end come through on this. Because let's face the reality. Yep. It's that, in no that's way... My, that's exactly my assessment as well. They will make a deal. They're going to get it sorted out. They're trying to get something else in the process. But, yeah, listen to what he has to say and why. A victory for the Republicans if Ukraine were to be uh, overrun by Russians. That would look disastrous. Yep. Uh, and it's something exactly that they'd right. be held account for by the, uh, by the voters going exactly. into next year's election cycle. So I think that's something that they're not willing to take the risk of. I really do think in the end they will vote to assist Ukraine. Yeah, they're trying to get concessions for what they feel is their highest or one of their highest priorities, which is the border wall and uh, getting that immigration under control. But uh, I don't think that they're not going to do it. I, I've maintained consistently they're going to make a deal here. It's just a matter of what the deal looks like. You haven't mentioned Gaza. You haven't mentioned... Well, in passing, you've mentioned Israel. To what extent is this still center stage in terms of international concerns for the American political elite and, and for the uh, public? So it's quite surprising, actually. Israel has also sort of fallen off the pages of the news. I mean, it is getting a lot of press still, but for Americans, it doesn't come up as a top issue. Uh, about 34% of Americans think that we should be sending more assistance to Israel now. About 4% say we should be assisting the Palestinians. But the rest say they're sort of indifferent to the entire situation. Yeah, even Israel and Gaza is not a big concern, he's saying. Like only about a third of the population is really focused on that because they're focused on other things. Okay, so let's talk about some of these other things that they're focused on. This is a fascinating chart. This is Pew Research, and I'm going to draw a lot on Pew Research. This is June 21, 2023. Um, and I'm focusing on Pew Research because they're just respectable. They're, so here, look at the difference. You see this, this uh, line between the two positions. And this is where Republicans are on an issue, how important inflation is to Republicans and how important inflation is to Dems. Now, the Democrats are going to uh, be experiencing inflation just like Republicans. But I think a lot of what's happening here is tied to who's in office and who the personality is that is running against him, right? So let's talk about Biden and Trump. If you're a Democrat and your guy's in office, maybe you're thinking about inflation less. If you're already prone to not like the guy in office, you're feeling the exact same thing as this guy, you might be feeling this more. So that might be explanatory of what it is. But there's also something else that Republicans are a little bit more mm, aware of inflation and the deficit and that kind of thing, more often, generally speaking, than not. OK, I'm somebody some of you are going to challenge me, but I'm telling you, look at this federal budget. Now, this isn't just because of the cycle. This is generally the case where Republicans are more worried about the debt than Democrats tend to be. It's not just now. OK. So let's look at some other issues. Affordability of health care. It flips. Democrats are far more concerned than Republicans. Uh, the ability of Democrats and Republicans to work, working together. Comfortingly, they're both pretty concerned about that, you know, we're not really working together. Uh, other issues. Gun violence. Democrats are, like, way more interested in this particular subject than Republicans are, are concerned or worried about that subject. Uh, let's look at another one. Illegal immigration. Look, look at where re Democrats are. So when Democrats discount uh, Republicans' fervor for illeg illegal immigration, this is probably why. They really do. Like, this is their number three issue here. 77, 72, 70 right? This is very, very high on their scale. Legal immigration barely factors to the Democrat mind, but to the Republican mind, it's huge. This is a 45 point or 47, yeah, 45 point difference. Uh, this is a huge difference here. Um, 
and let's see, where else is there a big difference? Like climate change, Democrats far more than Republicans. Racism, Democrats far more than Republicans. So we really are thinking about things differently, generally speaking. You'll notice that Ukraine is not even on this particular map. These aren't, that's, so it's not one of the greater values and it's, it's far more intense on the Democrat side than it is on the Republican side. Okay, let's look at another chart. This is a 2015, and I'm going back to 2015 for a reason to make a particular point. 2015, Republicans and Democrats sharply divided about how tough to be with Russia. Back in 2015, this predates Donald Trump. This is why I'm bringing you here. This is the kind of Republican that I am, okay? Okay. Uh, U.S. should use military force to defend NATO ally from Russia. 69% Republicans, 47% Democrats. Support NATO sending arms to Ukraine. 60% Republicans, 39% Democrat. Increase sanctions on Russia, 40 to 23. Okay, you're seeing a trend here. Support Ukraine joining NATO, 71 to 59%. Uh, Russia is a major military threat to its neighboring country, 67% to 56%. On every category, Russia is to blame for military violence in eastern Ukraine, 50% to 39%. Support Western countries sending economic aid to Ukraine, 69 to 60 On every category, Republicans like me were already there in 2015. Now, something shifted from 2015, and what's the factor? Well, you can probably guess that it would be Trump, but it's not just Trump. It's Trump and the populists that he brought with him, the somewhat independent, not conservative, but populist, maybe isolationist types. So that changed things. Okay, here, this is a new, another poll. This is an NBC poll, and the date was July 18th. 2018. So let's look at this poll and you see this. By 2018, something can really change. Which possesses the greatest immediate threat to the United States? Republicans are looking at ISIS at the time as being the greatest threat. China coming up behind it. Now, China is becoming more and more of a threat. The government is recognizing it, not just a competitor, but really they could become more militant. And that is a legitimate thing, I think. I believe that that's the case. But where was Russia in Republicans' minds at this point? Something had shifted radically between 2015 and 2018 in the way that Republicans as a party started to look at this. Remember in 2015, Democrats were way behind Republicans on all these things related to Russia and Ukraine. But now, 2018, Democrats are starting to see a significant, like they're lapping Republicans in how they see Russia as a threat. Okay, another Pew Research poll. This poll is 2022, March, so shortly after the invasion. Republicans are more likely than Democrats to say that U.S. is providing Ukraine with not enough support, right? Look at this. The darker the bar, the more that it is um, It's saying it's not enough, okay? Republicans are far more saying that you're not providing, you're not doing enough for Ukraine than Democrats, not by a whole lot, but Republicans were like more hawkish about it in the very early days. So just a little bit later, not just a few weeks later, you see that very unfavorable views of Russia have increased sharply since 2020. And I'm showing this to show where you, Republicans were and where they moved to, at least in the short term. Okay. Uh, Democrats were here at 50% unfavorable, and I already talked about that, and then they moved to 72% un very unfavorable, and these are very and very and very and very here, and this is total unfavorableness, right? Republicans moved from 32% to 67%. That's a pretty big jump right away, but there's not the same intensity, and the intensity is partly a factor of how involved in the world should we be and the fraction of Republicans that are isolationist, focus on problems just at home, is much larger now in the Republican Party than it was just in 2015. Okay. Americans hold positive feelings toward NATO and Ukraine and see Russian as an, Russia as an enemy. This is May 10th of 2023. This is one of the most recent that I can find. If you can find more recent polls, please feed them to me. I, I'd like to see this. Now, in this poll, we see that Democrats are more positive on Ukraine than Republicans. And we know that. That's clearly the case. Look at the chart of favorable and unfavorable. 
This is the Republicans and this is the Democrats. Democra uh, Democrats are very heavily leaning this direction. Republicans are favorable, split, and unfavorable. They're slightly more, at least at this point when this poll was done a few months back, slightly more support. And it, I think it's about 50-50. There are Republicans like me. So it pains me when I see people put in the comments, oh, the GOP, they're just a bunch of this or that. Don't drive Republicans like me who want to support Ukraine away. It's not helping anybody. I get it. You can vote against the Republican, but like I said in the video yesterday, what we want at the end of the day is a Democrat candidate who supports Ukraine and a Republican candidate who supports Ukraine. And if you're a Democrat and you want to vote for the Democrat candidate who supports Ukraine, go nuts. That's fine. Don't vote for the Republican. And if you're a Republican, I want you to be able to vote for a candidate who supports Ukraine. But I walk through all of these charts to help you try to understand what's going on. I think so. Here's my theory of what has changed. I think the party has shifted because Donald Trump has brought in with him some isolationist or less involvement in the world kind of wing of voters. That's who he has excited and got to join with old school Republicans like me. That's what got him elected. So I think there's that, that undercurrent within the party. I think there's also a backlash to the current president. So because now... Because Biden was president when this kicked off, there's stronger Democrat support. I wonder, I could be completely wrong, but I wonder if Trump was in office right now, just as a thought experiment, would the Democrats be supporting Ukraine to the same degree that they are? In the same way that there's a knee-jerk bias against Biden by Republicans, I think there might be a knee-jerk bias against Trump by Democrats if Trump were still in office and Trump were supporting Ukraine. Now, th those are all assumptions. You can't prove it, but I wonder. I think there's some element. I don't know how many points that would cost, but I think some element is there. Okay, that's my assessment. I hope that helps clarify things. I, I don't know that I've answered any of your questions, but at least I've helped you to think through this. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the attention, the likes, the shares, the subscribes, and thank you for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.